Kia ora koutou. Welcome to Science Live Expedition Snares. My name is Scott Ogilvie. I'm an educator here at Te Papa. And in November 2013, a small group of Te Papa scientists uh, undertook an ex expedition to a group of New Zealand sub-Antarctic islands known as the Snares. We're now live at Te Papa to talk to some of these scientists who are, uh, were on that expedition uh, to find out what's so special about these islands, uh, what you can find there, and uh, what they got up to during the time on the islands. Um, so to join us to start with, I have one of the scientists who are on uh, on the island, and that's Colin Miskelly. Uh, and Colin, welcome along to the show today. Yeah, kia ora, Scott. Um, first of all, can you just tell us a little bit about what it is you do here at Te Papa? Yeah, I'm one of the curators in the vertebrate team here, so I'm responsible looking after the birds and reptiles and a few of the other animals in the collection. Excellent, and on occasion you get to go on some nice journeys to various parts of the country. Um, so can you tell us, first of all, whereabouts are the Snares Islands? Yeah, you know, the Snares are one of a group of islands just south of New Zealand. Collectively, they're, they're known as the Sub-Antarctic Islands. And the Snares is the northernmost of them. So just here we can see they're situated about 100 kilometres southwest of Stewart, Stewart Island, Rakura. So to get there, uh, we chartered a vessel from Bluff and we travelled down the east side of Stewart Island. We actually waited for a couple of days at the southern end of Stewart Island. And then from there, it's about a uh, four hour cr crossing uh, ac across to the Snares Islands, which are a nature reserve admi administered by the Department of Conservation. Okay, so it sounds like a very isolated group of islands. Um, can you tell us a bit about what it was like on the Snares Islands and the kind of wildlife we could find there? Yeah, well, I've got a, another map here showing the, the layout of the group. So that the main island and Broughton Island uh, collectively are around about 300 hectares. So just in scale, that's roughly three kilometres along this longest axis. Uh, the Te Papa team were based on the main island. Uh, there is a, a small hut there that's been there since the 1960s. And the, main two, and the two main islands are, are covered in vegetation, so roughly half of it forest and half of it tussock grassland. And then there are some rocky islets uh, scattered around the group, which we'll talk a bit, a bit later in the show. OK, so... Um, can you tell us a bit about the wildlife that you found there or encountered on the island? Yeah, the, the snares are, are famous for their bird life. Uh, there's a huge number of birds breed there in terms of their ab absolute numbers. So uh, we'll be talking about some of the high numbers with some of the burrow nesting petrels later on. But there are also several bird species that only occur on the snares islands. And we've got a few examples here from the Te Papa collection. So starting with the snares crested penguin, which as its name suggests only nests on the snares, uh, there are about 30,000 pairs of them there. Uh, they're a seabird, so they spend a lot of their life at sea, and because of that they can travel reasonable distances, you know, obviously they have to swim, uh, but they do occasionally turn up around southern New Zealand, so places like Otago Peninsula and Stewart Island uh, do, do occasionally have snares crested penguins coming ashore to molt. And then among the smaller birds, uh, we've got the Snares Island fern bird, uh, which is related to the fern birds on the New Zealand mainland, where on the mainland they're mainly found in wetlands and very dense uh, wet vegetation. But on the snares, they're common throughout all the vegetated habitats, uh, and they're a lot bolder. It's one of the features of being on an island that hasn't got any predators like the snares, or at least no, no introduced predators that the, a lot of the wildlife is, is very tame. And then we've got the Snares Island tomtit, or black tomtit, which is related again to the tomtits on the main islands. So in, on the New Zealand mainland, the tomtits are black and white, so pied coloration with a white belly, but the Snares population is entirely black. Uh, they shouldn't be confused with the black robin on the Chathams, which again looks very similar and is a related species. Then probably the species that's least familiar to uh, I, I guess bird watchers in New Zealand is the Snares Island snipe. Uh, snipe are a group of birds that are related to godwits and other shorebirds, but they behave like a little kiwi. In fact, their, their Maori name is Tutu Kiwi. Uh, they, the, there used to be forms of snipe on the New Zealand mainland, but they were wiped out by uh, introduced predators. So most of the mainland ones had gone by the time of European arrival. Uh, but since then, some of the populations on outlying islands have been wiped out as well, most recently in the 1960s when ship rats got to some of the mutton bird islands off Stewart Island. Uh, but the Snares Island snipe was only found on the Snares, but it's more recently been moved to two other islands near Stewart Island. 
Oh, so that's uh, very interesting. These birds are only found on these very small islands um, in the sub-Antarctic. Um, besides birds, were there um, any other unusual creatures that you found down there? Uh, probably the most surprising uh, invertebrate there is a, a very large leech. Uh, we've got an image of one here. Uh, the, the, not many people realise that there are leeches in New Zealand. Uh, there are a few species that occur in aquatic habitats, but there are also a couple of species that occur on islands off New Zealand. And they apparently feed mainly on birds, occasionally on seals. Uh, so these ones on the snares are, are most often found near penguin colonies or albatross colonies. And um, were they known to bite humans at all? Uh, not, there's not many records of it, uh, but I did get bitten once in my time as a, a research student down on the snares in the 1980s. But I never actually realised it at the time. I'd, I'd been out working at night and just woke up in the morning with uh, blood all over my leg and a characteristic triangular bite mark, uh, which is uh, caused by the, the triangular shaped jaws of the leech. Not a very nice thing to wake up to, I can imagine. Um, moving on from the, the animals there, can you tell us a bit about um, what was this Tapapa expedition um, hoping to achieve? Were you hoping to make any new discoveries while you were down there? Uh, the, the main projects that we were working on were bird related. We were also were doing some plant collections, which uh, my colleague An Anthony will talk about soon. But the bird projects were focused on some of the seabirds, and so they were mainly looking at their population dynamics, so whether the populations were declining or increasing or stable, but also looking at the genetic relationships of some of the species down there. And they're both topics that we're going to explore a bit later in the show. Oh, excellent. I look forward to hearing a bit, a bit more about that. But I think um, it'd be nice now to hear a bit about some of the plants on the snares. Yeah, and uh, to introduce that topic, I'd, I'd like to uh, bring in Anthony Kuzabs, who's part of our team and was on the island with us in November, December as well. Okay, thank you, Colin. We'll hear from you a bit later on in the, in the show. Um, welcome along, Anthony. Can you, um, again, just first of all, tell us what it is you do here at Te Papa? Yeah, kia ora, kia ora Scott. Um, so I'm a collection manager with the science team at Te Papa, and I, I look after the day-to-day -day management of our herbarium, and we hold about almost 300,000 specimens. Okay, um, and you were also part of this expedition, as Colin said, down to the Snares Islands. Um, can you tell us um, kind of what it was that you were doing down the Snares as a botanist? Sure. Um, well, I was helping these guys with their field work, um, but I was also collecting lichens, moss and liverworts, and we were collecting uh, spiders as well. Okay, um, so I know Te Papa does a lot of collecting um, in, in botany. Can you tell us a little bit about um, why it is that we collect specimens? Yeah, well, we work together um, with other herbaria throughout New Zealand um, and collect specimens that are from um, specific map grids or ecological districts. Uh, and these, these are used by taxonomists to uh, differentiate between species and uh, also by land managers to maybe identify um, potential new weeds that may be coming uh, into the area. Um, yeah, so a number of uses. Okay, so it sounds like an important thing that we do here at Te Papa. Um, so to, going back to the, the snares now and the expedition there, what was it that um, you found interesting about the, the snares, the, the plants on the snares? Um, the, the first thing I'd have to say is the, the really low number of seed plants and ferns on the island. So there's uh, 22 in total, um, which is quite low. I mean, they are small islands, um, but the it's quite, quite a, uh, a mix of plants with a very southern distribution in New Zealand as well, um, dominated by plants with a southern di uh, dis distribution. And there are circumpolar plants as well which touch the New Zealand territory in the sub-Antarctic island, so quite a unique mix of plants. Uh, and the other thing I'd say is um, the sub-Antarctic islands of New Zealand are known for their, their megaherb communities. Uh, on the Snares Islands, there's only a couple of places uh, of mega herbs, a uh, couple of plant community, mega herb plant communities, um, and they really stand out. So I've got some of those here to show you. So um, this is Anisotomy acutifolia, and it's actually endemic to the Snares Islands. And this plant spe uh, specimen here um, it was collected in the 1940s on quite a famous expedition. And uh, we've just got a photo there to bring it to life because uh, you can see they age quite a bit over time. 
although that's fine, that'll if that's kept in good condition, uh, you know, low humidity and a nice dry environment, that'll that'll keep for many hundreds of years. Okay, so it definitely looks better in a photo these days than the old one collected many years ago. Um, um, there's another mega herb here that I can show you as well. So that's uh, still Bacarpa robusta, and um, again, I'll just show you an, <laughs> uh, an image of that. And uh, so the, the leaf on the specimen sheet there is um, about 35 centimetres. And I'll just uh, peel this away. The, other, the guys found a leaf on the island measuring about 73 centimetres. So, you know, twice as much across and um, about four times as big. They can get quite large. Yeah, I mean, that's 75 centimetres. Do you know if they get bigger than that, or is that about the, the limit? That, that's the uh, known limit to date. <laughs> OK. Well, I mean, it's still a very large plant. And I can see you've got some, some smaller ones here as well. Can you tell us a bit about, about those? Yeah, so the, the, the seed plants and ferns are quite well known on the island. They're quite well coll collected and um, quite, a, quite stable, I guess, in terms of numbers of species. And Doc do a really good job. Um, with their biosecurity, limiting um, researchers on the island, numbers of researchers on the island, and so they seem to be quite stable. What we were focusing our collecting effort around was um, mosses, lichens and liverworts, and it was these groups that we felt um, we had a better chance of, of increasing the known uh, biodiversity of the islands. So um, here we have a liverwort, if you can zoom in on that. And this is quite quite a spongy um, looking plant. Uh, it was growing in a mound in an area of recent disturbance. So potentially it could have been overlooked um, when there was a lot, uh, the last, during the last thorough survey on the island, which was probably the 1960s um, in regards to liverworts. But it could also be a recent introduction, so. Um, the other, this is a species of moss here too. So that's a additional species to the island. So together we had about eight additional species of liverwort. And this, sorry, this is the only known uh, moss species. And I'll just um, put an image in, if you can move up there, cameraman, thank you very much. And that's showing the, the fertile sporophytes and the moss leaf in, <laughs> in its living. OK, well, I know we're just about out of time here. Um, so thank you um, for telling us about the plants here, Anthony. Um, and we're going to move on a little bit more and uh, find out a bit more about some of the birds on the, on the snare. So thank you again. Thank you. So um, the Snares Islands are known as being a bit of a hotspot uh, for seabirds. So with me now is Alan Tennyson, who's going to tell us a bit more about some of the seabirds uh, on the Snares. Welcome along, Alan. Yeah, hi, Scott. Wait till you get into shot. Um, <laughs> okay, welcome along. Can you tell us a little bit um, about what it is that you do at Te Papa? Yep, I'm one of the vertebrate curators here. Uh, I study uh, not only fossils, but also living birds, and particularly one of my interests is seabirds. Okay, and we just mentioned the snares are a seabird hotspot. Um, can you tell us a bit more about some of the seabirds that we can find on the snares islands? Sure, yeah. I mean, the snares is, is an absolutely amazing place for seabirds. There are just seabirds absolutely everywhere. Um, Colin mentioned the penguin already, but the birds that absolutely dominate the island are some of these smaller uh, birds, which we call different kinds of petrels. Um, they're related to albatrosses, uh, quite closely related, but they're obviously smaller. Uh, and uh, like albatrosses, they spend most of their time uh, feeding at sea, uh, but they have to come ashore to nest. Uh, these, these ones come ashore in, at night time, unlike albatrosses, and they also dig holes in the ground, in the ground like uh, rabbits to burrow and nest in. Um, so we've got uh, examples of some of the more common ones on the table here. This one here is the sooty shearwater or titi or uh, mutton bird. Uh, I should point out though that the snares population of, of sooty shearwaters isn't actually harvested for mutton birds, so it's a, 
uh, yeah, it's not interfered with by people on land. Uh, the next most common species on the snares is this little guy here. This is a diving petrel. There are hundreds of thousands of them nesting on the island. Uh, and this one here is probably the third most common. It's another burrowing petrel, the mottled petrel. Uh, we're not sure how many there are, but tens or maybe hundreds of thousands of them. So you can see these birds are you know, incredibly abundant. Um, and here is a couple of other ones. These are prions, which we're going to talk a little bit more about, these small grey ones which occur in, in the thousands on the snares. Okay. Um, did you want to tell us about this bigger one now or a bit later on? I'll come to that one a bit later when we're talking about the... Um the prime surveys, I think. But okay. That is a skewer, this one. Right. Well, that was a good introduction to some of the, the seabirds there. So um, can you tell us a bit more now about what it was you were studying on the snares? Sure. Well, we were specifically interested in, in two of these species uh, because there were concerns about their numbers. Uh, the sooty shearwater here uh, was has been surveyed since the 1970s and numbers appear to have been declining quite steeply so we were really interested to know whether the numbers had were continuing to decline or had stabilised or, or whatever. The other one was this, the, the broadbill prion here. Now um, in 2011 in winter there was a massive die-off of prions uh, around New Zealand. Uh, there was about a quarter of a million prions found dead, mainly on the west coast of the North Island. Uh, and no one knew where these prions came from, but we did, we, we did work out that most of them were broad, broadbill prions, which is this species here, and this is one that occurs on the snares. So we are really interested to know whether or not the snares population had been affected by this big die-off. Okay, so you're on the, on the islands um, and counting birds to, to look at the numbers and, and whether they were declining or not. Can you tell us a bit about how you go about counting when counting birds when there's just so many of them? Yeah, well, it's not an easy job. I mean, uh, these these birds are incredibly densely nesting on the island. Um, in the case of the the sooty shearwater, you know, we've got about one per metre square on average over the entire Snares Islands. So, I mean, it's very hard to walk around on the islands. There's so many at night you see them, they come raining in from the sky. It's absolutely an incredible sight. But um, at least with uh, these sooty shearwaters, what we can do is we can see their burrow entrances. So we can go around the island. What we did was we, we uh, worked out some random sites all across the island and counted burrow density simply by crawling along on the ground and working out you know, how many holes there were per area. And then we calculated that up to work out what the entire population size was. was. And with the prions, it's a little bit more complicated because they're more crevice nesters. So um, the nests are, are not so easy to locate because you can imagine if they're hidden in the back of rocks and things, you just can't see they're there. But we did have records of uh, from a couple of caves where you could actually see how many uh, nests were sitting in there from the 1980s. So we were able to go back to those same caves and see if the numbers had changed between then and now. Uh, but another, another way of actually monitoring the smaller petrels is by using the food of these guys. And that, as I said before, this is a skewer, a subantarctic skewer. Now they're uh, a predatory species of gull. Uh, they look a little bit like a seagull, but, uh, you know, but they've got a bigger hook and they're a bit, a bit more of a beefy sort of animal. And what they do is their main food is eat these small petrels. They, they swallow them up whole or rip them apart, and uh, the ones that they swallow, they, they spew up, they regurgitate the remains like this. So here's like a head of a bird and here are a few wing bones. And so we were able to go around the island and count the numbers of remains uh, that, they'd, uh, that they'd spewed up basically, and. Uh, compare the numbers of birds uh, in these regurgitations with uh, the numbers that have been found in the 1980s, because again a survey had been done in the 1980s, so we could compare numbers. So we assume in, in some ways that the numbers of birds left in these skewer uh, prey middens uh, reflect both the numbers and distributions of the small petrels. Okay, so it sounds like a, a lot of work, and in the case of the, the skewers, a bit of messy work as well. Yeah. Um, what did you find out after all this? Uh, well, with the, uh, the sooty shearwaters, uh, we did find there was a, an awful lot of them there, but we haven't crunched the numbers and done a proper comparison still, so we're, we're still working on that. Uh, with the prions, uh, we found both the numbers in the caves and also the numbers in the, the skewer middens were way down on what they used to be, maybe something like 10%. So uh, it looks as though the broadbill prions from the snares were definitely part of that big die-off in 2011.
Well, that sounds sounds serious. Yeah, well, uh, it certainly was was, was obviously grim for them. Uh, thousands and thousands of them must have died from the snares. But the good the good thing is that we did find some chicks still, and as we presume it was a natural uh, die off event, we hope that the population will be able to rebuild. Okay. Well, that sounds like better news as well. So um, that's good to hear. Thank you very much, Alan. Okay, thanks a lot, Scott. Um, so we've heard that the snares are a sub-Antarctic island group um, south of New Zealand. Uh, part of that group is a, a smaller uh, group of islands away from the main group. Um, and to tell us a bit more about that um, is Colin Muskelly. Um, welcome back, Colin. Yeah, hi, Scott. Um, so there was the, the main group of islands, um, of the Snares Islands, but I know um, you and the team spent a little bit of time on some of these other islands as well. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, well, it was just one, one island that we visited. It was actually when we first got down there. I, I mentioned at the, in the introduction that we waited at the southern end of Stewart Island for a couple of days before we ventured forth to the Snares. And the reason for that was that we were waiting for calm enough conditions to allow a landing out on the Western Chain Islets, which are about five kilometres southwest of the main group. And the reason that we were keen to land there was related to the prime uh, wreck that Alan mentioned, so back in uh, 2011, roughly a quarter of a million prions died on New Zealand beaches. There are actually six different species of prions involved, and one of them that we're very interested in here at Te Papa is one called the Fulmar prion, which does breed on the snares, but it's not on the main islands. So you've got the broadbill prions and fairy prions breeding on the main islet, islands, but out here on the western chain you've got the Fulmar prion. Um, so we're going to um, ask a bit more about the, the Fulmar prions and that work in a moment, um, but before we do, was there, was there anything else besides the birds that you found um, up on the islands? Yeah, I'll just show an image here of just what the islands are like, and this gives an idea of, of why we had to wait for calm sea conditions to land there. So the, there are five islets in the group, uh, they have the Maori names of one to five, so Tahi, Rua, Toru, Fa, and Rima. And we landed on Toru Islet, which is the largest island of the group. And there are actually several species of birds that breed on these islands, but they're quite different to those that you find on the main islands of the group. So just looking through what we've got here, uh, this is a species of albatross called the Salvin's mollymawk. So on the main islands, there is a smaller species called the Buller's mollymawk breeds, but the Salvin's mollymawk uh, breeds on the western chain and then also on the, a group of islands called the Bounty Islands. Uh, then you've got uh, Cape Cape petrels, this black and white species down here that are a surface nesting petrel, so unlike the uh, similar size sooty shearwater which nest in burrows, uh, these nest uh, on the surface, uh, in, on cliff ledges and among rocks. So these islands are, are pretty much just bare rock and so the, the birds that breed out there are things that breed on, mainly on the surface. There are also a few crested penguins out there, but the species that we were looking for was a, a bird called the Fulmar prion, uh, which again, like the prions on the main uh, Snares Island, is mainly a rock crevice nester. So we had to uh, get underneath some of the rock tumbles and poke into some of the crevices to find where they were. Okay. Um, you've just mentioned the molly mock. Might be a very quick, good time to have a, a, a question. We've had um, a question come in um, from the students at uh, um, Makata Model School, and they just asked, um, are there any breeding colonies of albatross and molly mocks? Um, I think you mentioned the one on this island. Is that the only one? Uh, on this particular island, there are... The main colony is of the Salvin's mollymawk with uh, about 700 pairs, but there are a few other species that do turn up among them. Um, back in the 1980s, there was a single pair of black-browed mollymawks uh, nested there. But on the main Snares Islands, I mentioned before, are smaller species, the Buller's mollymawk, and there's something like 5,000 pairs of them there. So, they're, yeah, quite, quite common on the main island. OK, thanks for that. Answered the question. Um, so besides the birds, um, there's a photo here. Can you tell us a little bit about what you, what this, this other creature that you found on the island? Yeah, uh, yeah, one of the other tasks that we were requested to do before we headed away was to look for a very unusual slug. Uh, it's actually related to marine slugs, but it's uh, returned to the land, so to speak. Uh, and they are mainly found in coastal environments in these sub-Antarctic islands. And so a researcher at Otago University had asked us to look for them. And we searched on the main island without success. And the only place we actually managed to find some was on Toru Islet in the western chain. So we're very pleased that we did locate a few for her. Yeah, indeed, it looks like a, a rather strange, strange creature. Um, so back to the birds on the islands. You were looking at the fulmar and the, and the, and the fairy prions. Um, and I believe you're taking blood samples, is that correct? Yes, well, probably better to uh, talk to our, 
another staff member about that who's very much involved in the genetic analyses. So I'd like to introduce uh, Lara Shepard, who's part of the Tapapa team as well. Okay, thank you very much, Colin. Welcome along, Lara. Thank you, Scott. Can you just tell us quickly what it is that you do here at Tapapa? Yep, so I'm a geneticist here at Tapapa and I work with a lot of the different curators to uh, sequence DNA from different plants and animals to understand how they're related to each other. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so Colin and the team were down on the islands and Colin mentioned they were collecting blood samples from, from some of these prions um, and, and brought them back here to Tapapa. Can you tell us a little bit about um, why you needed them and, and what it is you'll be doing with them? Yeah, so what we wanted to do was look at uh, the former prions collected from Toru and use the blood to isolate their DNA and compare this to fairy prions from the main Snares Island northeast and also to compare with um, other fairy and former prion populations from around the Southern Ocean. And I've actually got uh, some of the blood samples here. So these were collected by the team and have been stored in our freezer. So you can see right... Right at the bottom there, there's, we've still got a bit of blood. Um, so these, this was blood from the fulmar prions and the fairy prions, and you were extracting, looking at the, the DNA there to see if these were related, is that, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So um, we all have DNA, DNA inside us, all living things, and we inherit this from our parents. And as our DNA is copied inside our cells, um, you can get errors that happen, so mutations. And we can look at these and use them to build a family tree. So what we were wanting to do was build a family tree of prions to see how the different species are related to each other. Okay, and you think you might, they might, you might discover that they're, disco they're, they're related in, in unexpected ways? Yeah, yeah. So we actually did some preliminary work last year just using... Um, prion study skins from the collection. So these are skins that have been collected maybe 50 years ago. Um, and I've got an example over here. And so with these ones, we just took a bit of um, skin off their feet and used that to, um, to get the DNA. Unfortunately, with, with birds that are this old and that have been um, preserved in this way, we can get some DNA, but it's not as good as getting it from blood. Um, and also we only had a few. Um, and the results that we got from this preliminary work showed an unexpected result. What we found was that the fairy and former prions from the Snares Islands were actually more closely related to each other than fairies were to fairies from the Chathams or other places and formers to the formers in the Chatham. So that was an unexpected result because if they're the same species, we would expect fairies to be more closely related to other fairies than they are to formers. So what we wanted to do was get more samples to test this. Was this just a strange result we got from a few old samples? Um, and also get better DNA so we can um, test it more rigorously. Okay, and um, can, you, can you tell us, have you completed these tests yet? Um, and if so, what kind of results have we, have we got? Um, we've done a little bit more um, and our results so far look to be supporting this. Um, we want to get uh, look at a few more DNA regions just to kind of really test it and make sure um, that this is a result um, that we're going to get. And there's two possibilities we think um, why we might have this result. It could be either that the different, um, the different forms of the prions, the former shape and the fairy shape have evolved independently in different places, like the Chathams and the Snares, or it could be that there's been some past hybridisation between the different species, which has given us our results. So hopefully when we get the rest of our DNA data, we'll be able to distinguish between these different ideas. Okay, thank you for that. It um, sounds, sounds interesting and, and promising. Um, can you very quickly just tell us why this is important research? Yeah, so it's important to understand um, the species boundaries of these different prions so we can uh, manage their conservation correctly. Okay, thank you very much. Sounds like there's lots lots to find out and, and lots to be done based on this research. Yep, yep there is, certainly. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Lara. Cool, thank you. Um, and that has brought us to the end of our half hour and the end of our um, Science Live Expedition Snares Island. Um, but remember, science is always happening here at Te Papa, uh, and you can read about it on our blog. Um, of course, you can come and visit the museum and have a look at some of the, the science that's on display and keep your eye out um, for our next episode of Science Live. Thank you.